Today's presentation is by Colin Arrow. Colin um, <coughs> does a presentation for power pilots on mountain flying, and I asked him if he would adapt it for mountain flying for soaring pilots, and he said he would give, a, give it a try. So let's welcome Colin. Absolutely. I should tell you while he's getting set up, Colin is a fast team, so the FAA safety team people, leader, and uh, Fred, I'm sorry to interrupt, you have a, uh, and I apply glider techniques to their flying. So I, I tend to look at glider pilots as natural mountain pilots, and I suppose that's not necessarily the case. Um, so this is the first time through this presentation, uh, and it's obviously a work in progress. I don't know why PowerPoint is this laptop okay, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, a couple of generalities first, and then we'll go, uh, go into Bernoulli uh, and density altitude and how it affects performance. We'll talk about canyons, ridges, and terrain, and then I'll finish with uh, you know, a, few, a few words about land outs and uh, summer. The standard disclaimer applies to this talk. Don't uh, substitute anything I say today for uh, dual instruction with a real instructor. Um, Are you an instructor, Colin? Yeah, I'm a double I and a CFIG. That sounds pretty real to me. <laughs> well, I mean in the aircraft. Oh, okay, course. okay. Not, there's no substitute for real. Okay. okay, so generically the mountain environment, um, well this is again a, a slide that I showed at power pilots, but the uh, probably the, the most important point here is that uh, population centers and airports tend to be a lot sparse, uh, a lot more sparse out there than they are in the flatlands. So if you go down, if you land out, odds are you're going to be staying a while. So uh, definitely have a kit, have a survival kit. Uh, and you probably want to take along more stuff than you would normally take uh, in the flatlands. Because as I said, uh, we've got a lot of rough terrain out here and sparse population centers. So you're very likely to stay a while. Uh, also, I call them these personal ELTs, but these uh, uh, yeah, those things are great. Um, indispensable out here. And of course, a handheld radio and a cell phone are good ideas. But have a kit. Are there many power modes using Uh Actually, no, they're not. Yeah, you got an ELT on it. Um, okay, so obviously, uh, with regard to performance, the the mountain environment uh, is going to, you're talking about thin air, high altitude, high density altitude. So, let's talk about Bernoulli, the whole reason our aircraft fly. We know that the pressure drop in a, a, the, the pressure in the moving fluid is less than the pressure of the fluid at rest. So, the pressure drop, which I define as pressure at rest minus pressure at uh, velocity v, um, is defined as this delta. Felt the heat, felt the pressure here. And I normally teach mathematics at the college level. So I like to pick out the. Do you understand this? You don't have to understand this. But this is a hundred year old theorem that, uh, that allows you to group uh, uh, variables and dimensionless products. And Buckingham's pi theorem tells us that the pressure drop has to equal some constant, which we don't know, times the air's density uh, raised to the power s, which we don't know times the airspeed or the velocity raised to the power r, which we don't know. But if you, <laughs> so there's a last one you don't know, which is why it's a hundred-year-old theorem. Wow. Is, this what we're, is this what our 
our children are learning in college? <laughs> no, you, you have to let me finish. If we, if we take this result from this 100-year-old theorem, we know nothing. and we apply a simple technique that we teach to college freshmen to check their work in physics class, it's called dimensional analysis. See, these quantities have some dimension. Pressure is force divided by area. Density is mass divided by volume. Velocity is distance divided by time. If you plug those dimensions in and look at that equation, the only way this can equal this dimensionally is if r is equal to 2 and s is equal to 1. So using a very simple technique for, for checking your work, you can actually get some information out of this thing. And what we get at the end of the day is that the pressure drop in a moving fluid is proportional to the density, and it's also proportional to the square of the velocity. So if you double the density, you double the pressure drop. If you double the velocity, you quadruple the pressure drop. That's actually useful information, and we get it without doing any real math at all. So, uh, how do we apply this to an airflow? I wish I could figure out why this blue area is showing up. Okay, so uh, an airfoil accelerates, obviously, the air on the upper surface, and we get a pressure drop due to the, uh, due to the faster moving air on top. And the previous slide tells us the pressure drop, of course, pressure times area is the force, and the force, uh, it's the force we call lift. Uh, but this lifting force is proportional to the air's density, and it's also proportional to the square of the velocity, the square of the airspeed. So, if you double the density, or let's say you half the density, then you half the lift that the wing is producing, all other things being equal. If you double the airspeed, you quadruple the lift, all things being equal. Most importantly, let's say you cut the air density in half. For example, 18,000 feet, the, the density in a standard atmosphere at 18,000 feet is about half what it is in sea level. So up at 18,000 feet, in order to compensate for the reduced lift, due to the reduced air density, you're going to have to go faster, right? So if you cut the density in half, the square of the velocity is going to have to double in order to keep the lift constant. That is to say, the velocity is going to have to increase by about 41%, which is fairly significant. So you're going to have to be going 41% faster at 18,000 feet uh, in order to generate the same lift. That's the upshot to this slide. So, um, talk a little bit about a standard atmosphere. Um, the standard atmosphere, of course, so we know is 29.92 inches of mercury at sea level, 15 degrees Celsius. And the first two layers of the atmosphere are what we call the troposphere and the stratosphere. In the troposphere, we have a temperature lapse rate. And the standard atmosphere, it's 2 degrees per thousand feet. In the stratosphere, the temperature is constant. That's what characterizes these two chunks of the atmosphere. Um, so we know the pressure, density, and temperature at sea level and we know what the temperature structure looks like. What about the pressure and density with respect to altitude? What do those do? We know what the temperature does, but we're interested in density because that's what affects our aircraft's performance so much. I will skip the derivation of uh, pressure with respect to altitude in the atmosphere because that can take a lot of calculus. Um, but the upshot is that the pressure and density are strictly decreasing with altitude. You go up another 1,000 feet, and the density decreases, the pressure decreases. So there is actually a strict one-to-one -one relationship between density and altitude in a standard atmosphere, which is where we get the term density altitude. Density altitude is just a way for us to compare apples to apples in terms of aircraft performance and talk about aircraft performance in a way that makes sense to us. The performance of your wing and your, your aircraft is dependent on the density of the air, that is the mass uh, per unit volume of the air. But it doesn't make a whole lot of intuitive sense for us to talk about slugs per cubic inch or um, what have you. It just makes a lot more sense to talk about altitude. So we say that the density of the air in this room is 3,000 feet density altitude. That is, it's the same density as you would see at 3,000 feet in standard atmosphere. So we are talking about altitudes. But what, what we're really getting at when we talk about density altitude is the <coughs> density, mass per unit volume. So, uh, as I said, in the mountains, generically, we're talking about thin air and uh, low densities. We've got high altitude. Today, we're not going to be so hot or humid. Uh, but generically, high, hot, and humid is a bad combination. It gives you low density and 
corresponding uh, low aircraft performance. Now, the word suffers in this slide is probably a bad choice of word for a glider audience. Uh, but uh, as we get into thinner and thinner air, four components to the system start to uh, degrade. The pilot, assuming you're not using supplemental, uh, supplemental oxygen, uh, but of course, if you're flying away, you're going to be using supplemental oxygen. The wing, as we saw, uh, doesn't produce as much lift in the thin air as it does uh, down at sea level. And of course, uh, if you're flying an airplane, the engine, assuming it's non turbocharged, the prop also suffers, so it's a triple wing. Uh, as far as the wing, uh, I've already explained that at 18,000 feet, the, the density is about half uh, what it is at sea level. So your true airspeed has to be about 41% greater to make the same amount of lift. Um, just for reference, uh, the density at 10,000 feet, uh, dens uh, using a density altitude of 10,000 feet, uh, you get a true airspeed about 15% greater based on the number of we saw on the previous slide. Uh, however, the indicated airspeed is the same. So your sight picture changes. Uh, you've probably seen this on approach uh, this week. When you land at a higher altitude uh, airport, the runway markers are going by like this instead of going by like this. And your pitch attitude is going to be a little bit different. Um, so with respect to flying the terrain, remembering the, uh, the higher true airspeed, you're going to see a different sight picture so you've got a potential risk uh, for a stall if you're flying slow. And you're going to have a much larger turning radius. So if you're maneuvering your uh, terrain, give yourself a little bit of extra room uh, for that wider turning radius. And uh, of course, our ridges and canyons have uh, what I call fairly robust turbulence in them. Um, so again, you know, beware. Uh, remember the rules of the ridge? Pass traffic on the ridge side, and all turns are away from the ridge. Uh, there's a picture. Okay. Uh, with with uh, regard to flying the flight levels, keep in mind that higher true airspeed again. Uh, your speed envelope actually gets uh, smaller and smaller as you go higher and higher uh, because you have to worry about flutter. Uh, and flutter is based on the true airspeed of the aircraft, not the indicated airspeed. Whereas the stall is based on the indicated airspeed, not the true airspeed. Is that right, Fred? Correct. Okay. Land outs. I had to use a picture of Tim. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, so with regard to landing out, uh, I see a couple mental hazards here. Uh, the first is always uh, a reluctance to accept the situation. If uh, if you're in a situation where it looks like you're going to have to land out, make the decision and stick to it. Don't waffle. Don't try to save the day uh, when you're really low. And be prepared for the fact that you're going to be saying to yourself, this isn't happening to me. I don't have to do this. I don't have to land up. We all go through that. <laughs> it's amazing how, yeah. how how repetitious that is. You talk to everybody who's landed up the first time and they keep telling you, I didn't think I was going to have to do it. I can't believe I'm going to end up at uh, Sweetwater. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if you're in a, if you're in uh, if you're in a situation where, where you're looking at rough terrain, uh, don't worry about saving the aircraft, and don't be preoccupied about getting hurt. Worry about that later. Uh, but do your best for the time being. I think that's a serious point, though. Um, you, you can't get preoccupied with being hurt or saving the machine. That's what insurance is for. So insurance companies hate me saying that, but you have to wreck the ship to walk away from it. And get your own What's that? Yeah, the FBI, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, wreck Fred's equipment. Uh, okay, so a summary, rules to live by. Take survival gear along. Assume you're going to land out, and you won't be disappointed. Uh, pay attention to the effects of high density LT. And we've got lots of rough terrain, so really, really be extra vigilant to have a good land out spot within reach at all times. And I assume that people talked about the weather earlier in the week, but I can kind of enjoy this slide. Um, but it's, it's a hackneyed, uh, tired old expression, but clouds don't happen by accident. There's some physics, some process that generates them. So they really are a signpost in the sky. So never forget, 
for always remember. The clouds are always coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I like that slide. That's, That's, That's when you're the power pilot's level. Uh, it's called vertical development. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, that's the talk. That's what I came up with. Any questions? I'd like to add a couple of things to that. One is um, we talked about you talked about density altitude and its effect on performance. We talked about aeromedical factors at the beginning of the week. Do not forget we have high in the summer here. We have. On the ground, we'll have density altitudes of 8,500 or 9,000 feet. Do not forget that affects your oxygen consumption because the oxygen transfer, remember we did this thing about transferring oxygen through the alveoli, that is affected by density altitude. Just as if you were at, if you're on, standing on the runway here at 9,000 feet density altitude, you're starting out as if you're at 9,000 feet already. So. What, what you're saying is just just like the airplane knows what the density altitude is, your body So does your to. body. So don't come here in the summer with a high density altitude and think, well, I've flown out of here without wearing my oxygen until I got to 10,000 feet. Wrong. you got to start oxygen when you're on the ground in a high density altitude situation. Another thing I wanted to mention pulling about land outs. Um, in a land out situation, Every once in a while, you'll talk to somebody who landed out, and they said, well, you know, I saw this great field here, but there was a road over here, and I thought, I didn't want them to have to drive the trailer through the field to get me over here. So I landed near the road, and that's where I found this rock. Yeah. Um, land in the best location for landing, not in the best location for trailering. Uh, it's just, it's an absolute rule that if you, if you look for the place that you can trailer out of best, you're not looking for the place that you can land best. Don't do that. Make your decision making based on where you can land best. <coughs> and make and, the decision. It's, it's, and, oh yeah, an excellent point. You know, people who talk about landing out a lot say that one of the hardest things to get over is the idea that, yes, I am going to land out. So stop saying, it's not going to happen to me, it's not going to happen to me, and just start saying to yourself, where's the runway? Where's the IP? Where's my pattern? Fly a normal pattern. Do a downwind, do a base, do a final, and land where you pick the runway. It's, it's a really serious comment. It's a true story. When, uh, I took the altitude chamber ride about seven years ago. And I carpooled in, met a guy at the gate that I didn't know, and carpooled in with him. And he was uh, on crutches, uh, a lot like the guy in the movie Something About Mary. He was very, he was very badly injured. And he noticed my, I happened to be wearing my, uh, uh, my Simon's pin. And he said, oh, you're a glider pilot. Me too. That's how I got to be this way. It's a true story. And he, he ended up badly crippled because he tried to extend a flight, tried to push it a little too far, and landed out in a really rough area and paid the price for it. So, um, make the decision. <laughs> now, there's, there's another land out story I have to tell you. And this, this may be apocryphal, but I'm, I'm told it was true. And that's about the guy who is told, if you, find, if you find that you have to land out, and you're going to have to land out in a forest, land between the trees and assume that you're going to lose your wings but they're going to stop you from rolling and plan, just plan on aiming between the trees. Well sure enough two years later he had to land down and when his instructor came to, to retrieve him he said look at what a great job I did right between the trees and he said, the instructor said yeah but they're the only two trees in this whole field. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether it's true or not. <laughs> Can I share a little story that happened to me? For Please. For but I, but I told, share it loud because I can't hear I told everybody. you about it. I told, oh, Jeff, I told Jeffrey about it. I'm gonna, this, this happened to me back in the early 70s. I, I was still in the Navy after Vietnam. And I was flying a, 120, a 126 out of uh, the Orange County Soaring Society. And I, I was... 24, 25. I was the CFIG, and I uh, 
in the club, we, we would stop at samples on the way out to Riverside, and I had pancakes and syrup, and coffee for, for breakfast, and then for lunch I had lemonade and sugar lemonade. And I went from sea level to got to 126, and I was about 12,000 feet over foothills of San Jacinto. And it was hot, 100 degrees. I was dehydrated. I didn't get much sleep the night before. And I was at 12,000 feet, and everything was going fine. And all of a sudden, I start, started to feel strange. And then I felt panic. And it was really scary. My, I got tunnel vision. I was starting to hyperventilate, and I, I couldn't see anything for a couple of minutes. I pulled out the spoilers, and I was coming down. And I got down to 7,000 feet, and everything cleared up. And uh, this all happened about a minute, I guess, about a minute. And I flew several times after that, and I talked to several pilots. I talked even talked to a doctor who was a pilot. And he couldn't, kind of, there was, you know, that, that was really kind of the beginning of aviation medicine back then. I mean, you know, they didn't know too much about it. And I, I know in the Navy, in the Navy when we flew, when I thought about this, every time we flew in the Navy, in the morning, they would feed, it, they would feed us steaks and eggs or shit on a shingle. You know what that is? It was a high carbohydrate breakfast with a lot of protein. Now I know why they did it. And so after a result of this, I, I flew a couple more times and nothing happened, and I gave up flying. I stopped flying for it until I started flying down at Cal City with Cindy, and then I started flying with Fred. And I told Fred about this and, and, and Jeffrey. And anyway, I'm back flying again now, but if you probably see me. I eat a good breakfast, and as I'm going out to the flight line, I, eat, I have my cashews. I'm eating my cashews. And, and if I... You know, I, I'm, I'm, some people kid me because I spend more time tinkering my glider than I do flying it, but I, I like to put them around close to the airport. I, I did all my serious flying in the Navy, and now I just... Anyway, eat a good breakfast, and boy, I'll tell you, I, that's... That, uh, Be careful, though. Um, I, about six years ago, I grabbed... Uh, we had great conditions. I ran down here and grabbed a glider and went wave soaring. And as soon as I exceeded 24,000 feet, I got pins and needles in my arm, left arm and left leg. Mm -hmm. Left side of my body went fairly numb. So I took the spoilers up, descended to 20,000, yeah. boosted the oxygen, it went away. Okay. So I, I did another ascent, and upon crossing 25,000 feet, same thing happened. And when I got down on the ground, I remembered that, gosh, I had Italian food last night. Oh. And I don't know about you, but that makes me oh, yeah. fairly... Okay. You know what? You know what? Yeah. Italian food. Oh. P1, P1V1 equals P2V2. So as near as, as, near as I can figure, I, I had a gas bubble expanding in me somewhere and cutting off circulation. Yes. They, I don't think you ever did yeah. food. Italian food. Anyway, one, one, <laughs> one, more, one more point I was going to say. There's a, I've been on the website. I go on the website and I check out a lot of stuff. And I did find a website that... It's a new website. I found it on there through Open. You may want to check it out. But it's a natural. It's natural for pilots to be afraid of altitude. You know, I mean, if I go over to Glacier Point and I look down, it just drives me nuts, and I can't stand it. But being in a glider or an airplane, it's fine. But most people, most pilots, by nature, are afraid of altitude, not in the glider, but not, are not when they're flying. There's a website on there, and I was rather surprised when I found it. But it was. It, it's been. Uh, you might check it out. It's called High, high Anxiety. <laughs> high Anxiety. And it's about panic attacks to pilots. What happens to them? And you might check that out. What happens? And what causes it? And there's been a lot of study into it now. I don't think it's well known, but it's a real interesting site. So anyway, thank you. There's one other thing I'd like to mention about Landau's or flying particularly where we fly at the edge of the Great Basin. And that is cell phone coverage. Uh, you'll see that a lot of us carry spots, a little yellow thing that attaches somewhere in your, on your harness or on your glider. And that's supposed to talk to a satellite every 10 minutes and give whoever is watching a trace of where you are if you set it properly. And by the way, setting it is really important. An awful lot of people push the button to turn it on and then don't start the, the tracking feature. 
so that we get something here that says they're at Minden Airport. And for the next seven hours, that's all it does. It says they're at Minden Airport while they're off flying a long way away. But if you are flying in the Great Basin here or on the edge of the Great Basin here and you're not carrying a, a spot, you're carrying a cell phone, and you're forced to land out, you may find yourself landing out in, area, in an area with no cell phone coverage. Sweetwater. It's probably. I've never landed out there, but no. I bet it doesn't have Sweetwater. It doesn't have cell phone coverage. Versace doesn't either. Versace doesn't a lot of places in, 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 uh, in the valleys between the mountain ranges here, you won't have cell phone coverage. In theory, if you've landed out, in one piece, you've got a working radio. You can talk to airliners overhead on 121.5. And I urge you to, to remember that when you're on the ground wondering what to do next. Um, and if you have the spot, then of course that's going to, to let us know. If we see your spot is not moving after an hour or so, we're going to get curious about what, what's happening and try to do something about it. But do think, you know, Colin talked about packing a, a land-out kit. Do think if you're carrying a land-out kit about carrying some kind of a tracking device because your cell phone is not going to do everything for you. I don't know whether uh, Colin has answered or I have answered all your questions about flying in the mountains and flying on the edge of the Great Basin. But we're coming to the end of our wave camp, and thank you, Colin. Good presentation. If any of yeah. if any of you have any questions for any of us, now's the time to ask them. Otherwise, we can go out and begin to prepare to fly. Questions, comments, suggestions. If, because you're flying in such cold weather here for the way that, do you use any special lubricants on your flight? Well, most. Most of the, all the lubricants we use are things like LPS-1 and stuff like that. They're meant, made for aircraft use. And aircraft go high whether they're gliders or not. I know the powered ones don't go as high as we do typically, but uh, they're still <coughs> meant, meant to be cold weather lubricants. The only trouble I have ever experienced with the lubricants that we're using because of cold weather is actually the grease that we use, white lithium grease that we use on the pins, the spar pins. And that's not because of high altitude. We've assembled gliders out here in January where the, <coughs> the grease was like cement. It just it wasn't working at all well. But other than that, we don't use any special lubricants or greases. No. Just the aviation kinds. Yeah. Do you have a website with the information you gave today or any handouts? Uh, I do have a website that's got bibliographies on it from some of these talks, but I can make things available if you'd like. Yeah, you live locally there? Yeah, I'm, I'm local. Oh. Let, me, let me make sure. Handouts on this. Okay, yeah, I, should, I should have printed it out. So make sure to get my email address before I leave here. I'll get you what you need. Or do you want to say anything in a kind of a last day wrap up? Talk about flights before I got here. Yeah, we talked a little bit about yesterday's flights. Um, two good. Here's the interesting thing about yesterday's wave flights, uh, if, you, if you'll let me enjoy it. We had two people that climbed up to 27,500 feet and came back down. And when they got back down here, the winds on the ground were absolutely dead calm. Very unusual. Typically, you make a, a wave flight and you get back down on the, on the ground and you're barely able to get your glider on the ground and keep it from blowing all over when you're down. Yesterday it was like a, a, a picture book day. I mean, you, you, you folks that were here at the barbecue last night, standing outside in, there in our shirt sleeves watching the, the fantastic cloud show that was going on out there, really amazing, just very unusual. I think the gods were smiling on you. Yeah. Um. I don't really have anything to add. Mornings aren't my shining hours. So I'll probably, <laughs> I'll probably, those morning minutes go by really fast. To me, that's a physics lesson. 
and I think the 40 minutes are only 40 seconds long. <laughs> so, and then in the afternoon, those 20 seconds get tacked onto those minutes between like 3.30 and 4.30 when you really just want to take a nap and the afternoon seems to be dragging on. I think we've had a great wave camp this year. We've already set dates for next year, as I said last night, and um, I think there's, I, there's some good stuff percolating at the airport. And uh, we've got a big air show coming up at the end of August. Bobby's lined up some 13 performers that are going to be here. Um, she's expecting, I don't know, 10,000 people. Um, Radio control airplanes too. Uh, yeah, well, I don't, you know, I don't play, I don't need another hobby, so I'm not going to get involved in that. Um, you know, we hope, we hope our new alliance with Perland is going to be really exciting. We hope we can have them here in some form next year with a prototype or with their ship to do some test flying out of Minden. And uh, we hope they'll come in August with their prototype fuselage and have a booth here for the August show. Um, and I just think we've had a great crowd here this year. The sharing of gliders went really well. Everybody achieved their goals. I think I'm going to try, there's a thing called Survey Monkey that you can do online. And I think I'm going to put a little survey together to get your comments and questions so that we can improve this camp for next year. Um, I think it's been a great week and it's going to be an amazing summer. Um, anybody have anything they would like to say? I mean, we're going to fly today in, I don't know what, thermals? A thermals. Thermals? In the, in the air? In the sunshine. Jeffrey, have you come? Oh, can we hear from the pilots that flew yesterday and hear about the some of the stuff they did? Yeah, well, Kemp, let's hear from you. Well, actually, I was going to set up and just show a couple pictures here. I don't know what everyone's urgency is to get going, but What's first... What's the trigger temperature today? 11, 56, 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock. Oh, uh, okay, we've got some time. Okay. I just want to say that, you know, you think you know somebody, and then you don't know them. So... You're not pointing at me. I am, <laughs> I think so. so <laughs> I'm multi You know, she's... She's one of the few female pilots, you know, and then here she is, you know, actually running an operation. So yesterday, you know, of course, things started getting better, and my philosophy is, especially if you've come all this way, you better fly, damn it, because you're just wasting things, and if there's an upside opportunity, you're going to miss it. So I was a bit puzzled why everyone was still standing around, you know, about this time tomorrow or yesterday morning, but it's okay. Everyone has to make their own decisions. So I basically volunteered myself to, you know, fly any available planes that there were, throwing myself out for the mercy of... of flying, and eventually I took three people up, I took, Gabe and I went up for, uh, for a little while just to share our experiences, we came down, and then we got Lori, and we're getting ready to go up, you know, Lori's in the front seat, I'm in the back seat of Delta Delta X-ray, and basically I said, so, you know, Lori, um, I don't know you in some ways, I'm like, how much, how many times have you flown in the wave here? She said, I've flown mm, once. <laughs> I go, I was expecting a few dozen times, you know. She said, what? I go, like, oh, you're kidding. So I said, great, you know. So I just go through my standard things with somebody else in the cockpit, you know. The only deal I say with somebody in the cockpit is if you at all feel like you're not feeling good, you must say something. You must agree to that. This is not a contest, especially for guys. It's not a contest, you know. I don't, I don't want to make a bad experience. She agreed. We go up, and of course, it was as fabulous as those of you who saw it and all. Just to actually show a few pictures, but the same ones that you also put up. Anyway, it was just fabulous, and I was privileged to uh, to share that with her. I just couldn't believe it once. Well, you know, I fly the desk a lot, yeah. and I'm a timid pilot. I'll be very, I'll be very frank about that. And you know, I sit around the hangar with all you guys, and, and what do you talk about at the hangar? Near misses, blown into clouds, <laughs> getting that thing it's back that on the guy ground. Thing, you know. It's like, oh, great. So I sit around the hangar here and get scared. <laughs> well, it's true. I don't think I'm unusual among women. So, And I am a, I, I really love clouds. In fact, I'm a member of the Cloud Appreciation Society. And I thought I had a really low membership number. They're up over 25,000 members now. And I'm member 3,660. But Nick is like number 300. So he's got me beat. Nick, who went down to Las Vegas for the weekend. Um, and I think we should try to get that, get the guy who started the Cloud Appreciation Society, I think we should try to get him here next year. Oh, that's a great idea. So I'm up yesterday knowing I'm in very capable hands, and I'm just ooing and eyeing at all the clouds. 
and try to take pictures, which is just another lesson in how amazing the human eye is. Because, you know, your eye sees this, and your camera sees that. So you come home, ah, I said, wow, where do you see these pictures I took? Okay, well, wait, that one's not too good. That, well, no, it was prettier than that. So for me, it was just an experience, a great ending to a wonderful week to go up and see. The clouds we saw here were just the beginning. Once you got over and above those, the structures up to the north and the, 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 the beauty and the massiveness of this. At one point, there were, you were flying on a cloud that looked so solid and smooth, it looked like you could park your glider and get out and walk on I think Lori is the most fun person I've ever flown with doing acrobatics <laughs> because she giggles. <laughs> well, and Kathy said it's giggles. going to be a little rough. And I, I might be a timid pilot, but I've got guts of steel. So, but I don't know that, so I yeah. have to always assume that you know, some people will scare the crap out of them. Others will just kind of like, yeah. oh, this is great, let's do it again. No, I don't want to go through a rotor. Remember, rotor is a horizontal tornado. <laughs> Keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to be able to get hooked up to that computer real quick? Okay. This is, this is conditions that I, I really don't enjoy this at all. And so, uh, I thought, well, if that's, if that's normal rotor, heck, uh, in a power airplane that I fly, you'd avoid it like the plane. So for a week, Jeffrey has persevered trying to drill into me how to deal with these situations, and he did a pretty good job. And yesterday morning, because of the availability, I flew with Fred. And Fred gave me a flight where we entered the wave and started climbing. So we're happy with that. Fred called it almost a, a, a perfect mission. We, we did what we set out to achieve. And I looked at uh, <coughs> the conditions after we'd had lunch. And I looked at the gap there that we were going to be flying in, and I said, well, that ain't enough. I, I want a bigger gap than that. <laughs> and I went off and sat down at the end there watching the clouds. And eventually, we started to, it started to open up. And I wandered back, and everybody was getting excited. And I thought, this is it, boy. Get your suit on and get out there. And off we went. Now, the last word that Jeffrey said to me was, Dave, don't pull off too soon. <laughs> Gabe came and leant into the cockpit and said, Dave, it's working, it will go, just get in it. Mike towed me off and he said, Dave, we're at 8,000 feet and you get up. And I said, and you've got to understand, I'm wearing this damn mask. <laughs> the microphone's over here. And by the time I'd got everything coupled together, we'd passed through the lift. And Mike says, I'll have to take you round again, Dave. <laughs> so we went round again, and then he waggled his wings and said, bugger off. Just go away. So I pulled off, and everything went quiet. And I did the circle, as Fred had said, and found out where, which direction was the solid lift. And I just sat there. To my absolute amazement, it started to go up <laughs> at an enormous rate. So I thought, listen to what Jeffrey said, 45, 90 degrees, so we turned around, pointed it, and it went up even faster. So I thought, well, I can see the pass there. I'm 3.9 miles away from the airport on the computer. And if I stay here, I don't have to move very far. <laughs> So all I kept doing, just to keep myself awake, was kept turning 90 degrees and stayed virtually over the ground in the same place. Um, trying to talk to Reno, Reno wouldn't answer me. I heard uh, Nick would come up behind me. He was talk, trying to talk to Reno. Reno wouldn't answer him. So we just we just got on with it, and I got up to. 25,000 feet without any great problem at all. 26 was a bit slower, and I knew that I'd come off at 9,500, and I needed 16,404. 
And so if I got to 27, I knew I'd cracked it. So it was just a question. I'd been told that people had descended in lift of, of uh, two knots and had failed to achieve their goal. So I stuck with it, but it, that needle, I kept on thinking the damn thing was stuck. Anyway, kept changing direction, trying to look for the better, the better lift, and eventually the thing passed 27,000 feet, and I thought, just hang on for till it gets to 27,100, and then there's no doubt about where, where you've been. And at that point, circled down, and then I was passing below the cloud when, when the brain kicked in again, and earlier in the day, flying with Fred, he pointed out how to cross over the the wave mass and come in on the other side. So I thought, well, I wonder if this lift is still working because this is going to increase your options. Turned in into the wind, uh, plus six, and went up to 16,000 feet uh, from, say, uh, 13 or 14. Went up to 16,000, crossed over the wave mass, and I could see, to my delight, I could see the crop circle. And so then it was a question of pulling the air brake, circle down, get below the cloud, and then a normal, a normal landing. And uh, I have to say that that flight was absolutely amazing, and thanks to Fred and Jeffrey. But um, uh, I was, I was just absolutely in awe of, of what I saw when I got up to the maximum height. It was just brilliant. It was just brilliant. To see you feel those, high, you know you're high. <laughs> to see those clouds, it, 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 to see, and, and in all honesty, the, the, the thing that was that was causing me, I've heard so many stories in England of the clouds of going up through that gap and the damn gap closing up. And now I am a power pilot, I'm instrument rated, but I don't consider going, I need a six pack to play with that game. And, I'm, I'm so concerned about this cloud closing in uh, that, it, gap. that it was something that was on my mind all the time. And I, was, I was keeping a good eye on that, and keeping in a clear space. Um, but other, other than that, I thoroughly enjoyed it once, once I had, uh, started the building. Great. Right. Congratulations. Okay, just real quick, I just wanted to go through some of these pictures here uh, that uh, Lori and I uh, or actually a, a bunch of uh, shots from the day. I noticed, so just from a technical standpoint, if you look back at the slide mountain winds, they started to pick up in the, in the morning when they were dead, meaning like 13, 10 knots, and then they started to pick up around afternoon. By the time about 1 o'clock, they started hitting about 20, 20 knots uh, with gusts of 32, and then they peaked around you know, 5 o'clock or so at like 35 knots with gusts to 50 or so. So things are picking up. Uh, the forecast, which I showed you yesterday, you should remember the purple spot, the little purple spot around us. You know, actually, it turned out much better than the purple spot would indicate. But anyway, it's, uh, I was just very impressed with uh, how the day went. So, that's <coughs> here. so Dave and I went up first, and here we are going up through the gap. Uh, now, one of the interesting things on Gabe's and my flight was um, he made the comment, and I'll just say it verbatim, that he said that I was a little bit more aggressive than he would have been. Colin, we'll, we'll meet later. I didn't have a chance to say hi. I know. Right. Hi. Sorry. We'll, we'll talk some more. Take care. Um, so what happens is that, and if you notice these pictures, there were many layers of lenticulars. And from afar, it looks beautiful. But when you're actually working them, the risk is that you're in one, you're working one, and there's one right above you, and you don't see it because you're used to, as glider pilots, we look out and down. But when you're wave flying, you have to look out, down, out, and up. I mean, like, like this because there could be a sh edge right there, and I kept on pointing it out to everyone I was flying with. Just notice that edge we're underneath, you know, wherever we were. Because the problem is, you start going up, and then all of a sudden things kind of start fogging up a little bit, and you think, no, oh, it can't be stuck frosting up or something like that. But if you were aware that that edge was there, and if it's thin enough, you could just go right through it. You know, you can see it right in and all. So there was a, a little bit thicker edge than, um, and Dave was comfortable with, but I could see that there was some to it, so we could just kind of pop through that, so we did. And I said, that I, I agree with you that, that for the average person, it's not something that you can necessarily do, but I could see it was pretty thin, and sure enough, we popped out and put everything nice and clear. So, 
Anyway, so we started working up here, but again, you have to be with your own comfort level. The, 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 probably the better thing to do, the more conservative thing, is to move further out into the gap and then go up. So again, what I found interesting is how the texture of the clouds changed during the day. I don't see if we can find it with this. Is no, that's that's, that's what I was on about, was that yeah, narrow, that, this texture and visual gap. <coughs> Well, actually, this gap is, it was, it was okay, but then it widened up during the day. <clears throat> what I find is interesting is this, you know, the texturing here. You have a nice smooth stuff here, and I don't really know what causes that. It could be that there's a slight shear there, who knows. Uh, but that and, was... And by the way, the first point of the flight that David and I made yesterday, I think for David and I, yeah. when we hit that, <coughs> it was turbulent, it was not smooth. <coughs> Which is what you would expect from that look, right? It's got that little turbulent. Who knows why that is? I mean, it's supposed to be laminar, and who knows? Now you see the surface here. It's also it's it's smoother, but it's still not you know it's still not this stuff. You know, so who knows? There could have been things are not black and white. There could be a subtlety that there maybe is a, a more stable and less stable layer that just doesn't show up in the soundings. I mean, who knows? It's still don't know. So again, we're still on. I'm just interested in the striations of going up here of the, um, of the wave texture. So we keep on going up. Now we're probably around 16 or so. And again, it's still more that texture. It's looking so, uh, south. And this is about 130 or so. So I come back down and then we take glory. I wouldn't you put that even on my driver's license. So, so Lori and I took off, same thing. We, we didn't get off right at the edge. We got off about 8,500. So the ceiling was about 9,000 or so. We got off around 8,400 or so. We did some thermaling and, and the uh, rotor lift and we got up there. Uh, one of, were, were we with um, Jeff? Yeah, we were. Jeffrey, was you, were, you were up with Dave Bingham, right? In, in November, Victor. Right. And just as we were going up, I think um, Ken Foe was going home in uh, Grove. Remember we saw somebody yes, kind of yes. above us yes. going home? And what was interesting, so so oh, Jeff is above you. us. We, we he, he towed off before us. We worked with him underneath the cloud a little bit. He, he was getting some better climbs than we were. And then he was gone for a moment. We didn't see him. Comes back. And we see him, and he's only like maybe 400 feet higher than us, but he's in the laminar flow. And so I'm going below him like this, I'm getting nothing. So there's that, that cutoff, it was right around 9,200 feet or so. We were like definitely between 92 and 94, somewhere in there. And I'm, so, I'm seeing you go like this, and I'm, we're only 400 feet. And I'm, I, that's when I called you and said, we're trailing you on your left down right. a few hundred yards. And then we went up like this, and we're not. And so those, that's, back, seriously, back. okay, don't, don't take it personally. Get in a little bit more lift, you know, just get up through 92, 93, and then you'll be okay. And sure enough, we were, and, you know, off the races. So one of the interesting features we saw was this. Did any of you see this? It was this lone lenticular, like, way out west. I don't know if that's over a truck or something. I mean, who knows what's causing that? It could be off of the Donner Summit. Who knows? But it was just very strange. It, it, we called it the UFO cloud because it's just sitting out there by itself. And it didn't last long, like maybe like 10 minutes or so. Who knows why these things happen? It looked to me like a blimp. It even had a yeah. little underneath. It had a the little, little gondola. That, that could have been the little the gondola. gondola. Yeah. 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 yeah, maybe it is. Yeah, who knows? It was that was a uh, good deal, blimp. Impressive. So, uh, Lori and I ran up to just north of Stead. Uh, in fact, went a little north of Stead, and again, we're just looking south here. Now, do you think you were in the secondary? Oh no, we were definitely in the primary. primary. Okay. But notice here how, now this is around 2.30 or so, so we're at the peak heating of the day. Notice how there's a lot more of this cumulus looking stuff in front of the, um, in front of the uh, wave formation. And that's typical because, because now the ground, the sun has heated as, as much as it can get to the ground. It's heated stuff enough and that, so things tend to, there's more of this turbulent look. With, the wave is still working. It's just that there's this more of the turbulent look, and of course in the morning and the evening it's calmer, so that you have more of the nice, you know, classic laminar look. Is that that's going north? No, it's still looking south. 
we're looking south because right. it was more like four o'clock and we landed okay, about well, maybe. five. So I think it was a little later than that. Okay, maybe yeah, three thirty or so. And then this is the stack like right over where where you all day where you made your climb is do you I mean this is like right off of Joe's Peak. Typically uh, the, the, the tall of the formation is typically triggered by the larger obstacle upstream. I mean, that's kind of, it's not obvious, but, but that's, that's what causes, causes that, or some kind of hydraulic uh, action. 